Good morning. The traditional Stations of the Cross recall the passion and death of Jesus. The 14 significant stations or stops that Jesus made during his last hours on earth were honored in Jerusalem by the early church. Later, St. Francis of Assisi spread devotion to the stations by writing prayers and meditations on them. These stops, also called the Way of the Cross, give us the opportunity to reflect on the suffering of Christ as well as the suffering of those around us in our lives. They are often depicted in churches or in other places where religious art is displayed. Lent is a time in the church when we are invited to lean into the season and experience the passion and death of Christ with an eye fixed on the joy of the resurrection that Easter Sunday brings. Today, we will pray the Stations of the Cross and our reflections will be rooted in the many themes we've discussed in recent weeks as part of this year's Arupi Lecture series, and so let us keep those in mind. Father Pedro Arupe, the 28th Superior of the Jesuits said, Today, our prime educational objective must be to form men and women for others, men and women who will live not for themselves but for God and his Christ, who lived and died for all the world, men and women who cannot even conceive of love of God, which does not include love for the least of their neighbors, men and women completely convinced that love of God, which does not issue injustice for others, is a farce. Jesus experienced pain and suffering like us and like many of our brothers and sisters. We remember especially those who have suffered the most throughout this pandemic, the homeless and unemployed, refugees, the imprisoned, and so many more people throughout the world. Let us see them as we reflect on these 14 moments in the life of Jesus. We begin our prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. First station, Jesus is condemned to death. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Pilate brought Jesus outside, and he said to the people, Look at your king. They, at this they shouted, Away with him, crucify him. Then Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Behold your king, says Pilate. <clears throat> Away with him, the people shouted, as they sent him to his death. In one of his homilies from the Year of Mercy, Pope Francis reminds us that we must do for those in need. The way of the church is not to condemn anyone for eternity, but to pour out the balm of God's mercy on all those who ask for it with a sincere heart. We, are in, we in the church must leave behind her four walls and go out in search of those who are distanced those who are on the outskirts of life. We must fully adopt God's own approach, which is that of mercy. Who are the people in our world who may feel condemned for who they are or because of their living conditions? This past year has brought into sharp contrast the inequities of our world and the ways so many have been condemned due to the circumstances of life and the indifference of those who could have helped. We are called to live in solidarity as one global family, each of us made in the image and likeness of God. We are responsible for one another and for what happens to our neighbors next door and our neighbors overseas. Let us pray for all those who carry the cross of being unable to provide for their families. May those who are blessed with the abundance, share their goods with those who are in need. May we gain the wisdom to end the dehumanization of our brothers and sisters. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The second station, Jesus accepts the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Here is your king, said Pilate to the Jews. But they shouted, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king except Caesar. So at that, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. They then took charge of Jesus, 
and carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, or as it is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Jesus picks up his cross. It would have been a very weighty piece of wood, enough to support a man. Some feet from the ground. He has already been beaten. He has a crown of thorns put on his head. What crosses are we having to carry in these days? The cross of isolation. The cross of living with people who are hard to live with. The cross of a cramped flat with no garden. What crosses are others carrying? Those who are refugees or homeless. Those who have elderly relatives they cannot visit. Those who are anxious about money or jobs. Consider for a moment the particular cross that you are carrying in this pandemic. Do you have someone who you can talk to it about? Most certainly, you can talk to Christ in prayer. Jesus knows exactly what it is like to carry your cross. Let us pray. Lord, may we be strengthened as we continue to carry our own crosses, especially in this time of pandemic. And help us to be understanding and compassionate towards one another, especially towards those who are the most marginalized in our world. Amen. The third station, Jesus falls the first time. We adore, we adore you, O Christ, and we pray and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus is exhausted. The weight of the cross and the state of his physical being caused him to fall. Although Jesus fell, he got up again to continue on, on his journey to Calvary. Jesus fell and was able to get back up. Unfortunately, there are so many in society who seem to fall through the cracks. We can consider briefly just one such example from a woman served by the Jesuit Refugee Services named Christina. Christina is a migrant JRS met at the Kino Border Initiative in Nogales, Mexico. After coming to the desperate realization that she could not afford basic necessities in Mexico, Christina decided to flee to the U.S. in the hopes of securing work. Her coyote said it would only take five hours to cross the desert. So she brought no food or water for the passage. Her group was caught in the second night, and she fell and injured her leg while trying to escape. The border patrol ran by her, and she was not seen while they gathered the other migrants and began to leave. She knew she was well hidden, but how would she find her way out of the desert? The guides had run away, she was injured and had no food or water. She called for help, and when they did not hear her, she struggled to her feet and hobbled after them. She would become one of hundreds of migrants who die in the desert each year. Lord, we pray for vulnerable mi migrants that you may grant them strength and safety in their journeys. And we pray for open hearts to understand their desperate motivations. And we pray for courage to assist them in their need. Amen. The fourth station, Jesus meets his mother. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. At the fourth station, Jesus meets his mother Mary on the way to his death. We cannot imagine the anguish she must have felt as she watched her son, tired and beaten, make his way to his own death. It is at this moment that Mary sees in the flesh what her commitment to becoming the mother of Jesus would mean. Mary symbolizes all who stand in solidarity with those whose pain is public. Sometimes we meet others who are really struggling, and we know that they need our support. With your help, Lord Jesus, we can be like Mary, who loved you, her son, so much. Help all mothers through her prayers when they see their own children in pain and difficulties. Only a mother can really know what Mary knew at this point. Bless all of our mothers today and keep them safe. As we consider this encounter between Jesus and his mother, we can ask ourselves, how do we respond to the suffering of others, whether in our immediate family or in our global one? Let us look to Mary and the example she sets for us as she meets Christ carrying the cross. In the person of Mary, we have an example of courage, perseverance, and faith. No stranger to suffering herself, Mary desired to be with those in need. 
Let us pray for the grace to imitate her example as Vox sings the Magnificat. The fifth station, Simon of Cyrene carries the cross of Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. St. Luke's Gospel says, As they lead him away, they took hold of a certain Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country, and after laying the cross on him, they made him carry it behind Jesus. At this station, a man named Simon of Cyrene approaches Jesus and carries the cross for him as it has become too heavy. How do we act when we are asked to do a task that may require us to be inconvenienced? Simon may not have wanted to carry Jesus' cross, but he did it because he must have seen that Jesus needed help. Even Jesus needed help, and he wasn't too proud, of, proud to accept it. Human beings are social beings. We are called to live in community. By being together, by helping one another, we become the best versions of ourselves. We build a better planet. We bring about the reign of God. It's exciting to be a part of God's plan, to be out serving and caring for the poor and vulnerable. But let us never forget what we, too, are poor and vulnerable in our own ways. And often those we serve end up serving us. Let us never be too proud to accept what others give, let us remind ourselves that there is much to be learned from each other, from each person we counter. Let us pray. Lord, may you remind us that you have called us to carry your cross with humility and persistence and help us to ease the burdens of your people just as Simon did. Amen. The sixth station, Veronica wipes the face of Jesus we adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. 
When Veronica sees Christ's bloody face, she makes the bold choice to reach out and embrace him in his vulnerability and suffering. She allows herself to connect with and confront his pain and offer some little relief. And what a moment of relief this must have been. In the heat, dust, and pain of the journey to Calvary, this is a brief instant of soothing tenderness. Veronica comes from the crowd and wipes the face of Jesus. The image of his face remains on the cloth. In coronavirus wards, we encounter nurses who bring food and water to patients with a dry throat. Another holds the hand of a dying woman, consoling her just by her presence. In a block of flats, a young child writes a letter to an elderly neighbor, reaching out to them through the isolation. These are the Veronica moments, moments of relief and kindness, tenderness and concern. And these moments make all the difference, allowing the fog of pain, loneliness, and sorrow to lift and offering hope that even in cruel circumstances, love is present. The seventh station, Jesus falls the second time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. There's a great temptation to ignore the poor of our world by assuming that their plight is of, is of their own creation. Some may reason that poverty comes from laziness, ignorance, or a failure to seize opportunities. But this is an easy way out. We assign blame to someone else to escape culpability. We distance ourselves from a situation we think is remote from our own. We block ourselves off from the real struggles, personal histories, and present day challenges of the individuals and communities that we encounter. We see that someone has fallen, and we forget that we, too, can just as easily trip and find ourselves face down in the dirt. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, you meet us where we are in life with an outstretched hand rather than a thrown stone. Help us to do the same for those around us. Teach us what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. The Eighth Station. Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. People who were publicly executed in Jesus' time often would have groups of people follow them to the place of their death. Some women of Jerusalem saw the painful condition that Jesus was in as he walked and they were crying. Jesus focuses on them instead of on himself. He turns to them and says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep rather for yourselves and for your children. In his compassion, Jesus asks the women to weep for the most vulnerable members in his society at the time, women and children. Women today carry an oppressive cross of inequality. As the number of people living in poverty grows, the number of women among them grows disproportionately. More than two-thirds of the world's unpaid work is done by women. Half of the world's population lives on, lives on less than $2 a day, Nearly 2 billion people live on less than $2 a day, and 70% of them are women. Women bear the cross of domestic violence, workplace inequality, underrepresentation in government institutions, and more. We pray for an economy at home and abroad that exists to serve the people of families and communities. Positive changes have been made, but women still face the most poverty, lack of equal access to education and are at the greater risk for human trafficking. Lord, we pray for women and children around the world. You asked us to weep for their oppression, and we pray that we may see their gifts, their strengths, and their plight as you do. We pray for the wisdom to break down the structures that oppress people based on gender, and we ask that you protect this overwhelming majority of the displaced population. Amen. The ninth station, Jesus falls for the third time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. 
for a third time the weight of the cross overcame Jesus. He fell to the ground in a tremendous pain, but somehow managed to get up again. Jesus falls for the third time, and in this moment, one must have wondered if he would ever get up. Every part of his body is shattered, and even with Simon carrying the cross, he can barely put one foot in front of the other. During this past year of COVID, we have seen so many people overcome with exhaustion and so heavily burdened. We remember the images of the nurses with face masks, with faces marked and shaped by the elastic of masks, exhausted after 12, 14, and 16-hour shifts. We've seen them slumped in hospital corridors, defeated by the amount of suffering they are witnessing. As we recall these images, perhaps we can, through our imagination, make out the faint outline of a person sitting in the corridor with a nurse. They don't say anything, but just accompany them in their despair. That figure is Christ, fallen for the third time, with us in our moments of gravest despair, understanding exactly how we feel, never leaving us on our own. Let us take a few moments to reflect on God's love and care for us. Even when we fall to our own exhaustion, God is there to help us move forward.
The tenth station. Jesus is stripped of his garments. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Then they crucified him and divided his garments by casting lots for them to see what each should take. When Jesus arrives at Calvary, he's given some wine to drink mixed with gall as a neurotic to lessen the pain of the crucifixion. Jesus tastes it to show his gratitude, but refuses to drink it. He gives himself up to death with the full freedom of love. At this station, we reflect on Jesus being stripped of his garments. We imagine the emotions he must have felt as his dignity was attacked. The goal of this action was to humiliate Jesus. Ultimately, however, the lesson we learn from it is humility. Christian humility, properly understood, requires a strong sense of self, and the greater the humility, the stronger the sense of self. Humility is seeing and acknowledging the truth about yourself and your world. Jesus said that he was gentle and humble in heart, and the Gospels tell of our Lord, who knew perfectly well who he was, a man with an unshakably strong sense of self. Let us pray. Lord, help us to be humble servants of change, where we see ourselves as one with each other, as Jesus made himself one with us. Amen. The Eleventh Station. Jesus is nailed to the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus is executed by being nailed to a piece of wood, hung naked, exposed to taunts, and reduced to an object of ridicule. With each step closer to his death, Jesus was humiliated, ridiculed, and led to suffer more intensely. All over the world, people's dignity and human rights are still being stripped away. Every single person has a dignity that is rooted in being created in the image and likeness of God. Yet, so often, that likeness is denied and nailed up on the crosses of hatred, racism, sexism, and indifference. Jesus knew very well, as everyone did, that crucifixion was a cruel and terrible punishment. Death would sometimes take days. It was always carried out in public, its victims writhing in agony, and was the state's chief deterrent to frighten the general population. All human dignity was stripped from the condemned one. During our Arupe series this year, we were reminded of the number of people on death row who have been stripped of that dignity, whose value of life has been negated by such a punishment. Even in our own lives, we can feel stripped of our own human dignity because of the way someone else has treated us without respect. Or sometimes we feel stripped of our dignity when others do not accept us for who we are. Let us pray. Lord, Help us to see your face in those that our world considers the lowest of the low. Lord, help us to love as deeply as Dorothy Day when she said, I really only love God as much as the person I love the least. Amen. The twelfth station, Jesus dies on the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. At this station, Jesus surrenders himself on the cross. We may think surrender is defeat, but it is handing ourselves over to God so that we transcend death. The life of Jesus does not end here. The promise of victory, of justice and peace, and the reign of God is just beginning. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. If we truly desire to be peacemakers, we must desire to be agents of change. In a world that so easily rejects and would like to forget the homeless altogether, we must be committed to seeking, together with them, justice and the defense of their rights, to tackle the abuses they are subjected to, and the destruction of the very fabric of their lives. Let us pause for a moment of silence to remember that Jesus died for us and that he calls us to be people of peace as Vox sings the Sushipe prayer of St. Ignatius.
13th station, Jesus is taken down from the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus is taken down from the cross and buried in a tomb. Darkness settles upon the world. Whether it was out of mourning, love, or pity, these actions are just as important as his death. In our own hearts and minds, we too must take Jesus down from the cross and wade through the darkness. His sacrifice and his death are in vain if it does not result in any action on our part. A person living in a shelter hangs on the cross as Jesus does, only longer when they cannot find health care, work, or affordable housing. A homeless person living in a cardboard box hangs on the cross as Jesus does, only longer. An elderly person living in isolation hangs on the cross as Jesus does, only longer. A neglected child hangs on the cross as Jesus does, only longer. A brutalized prisoner hangs on the cross as Jesus does, only longer. Lord, many of our brothers and sisters today hang on a cross. Help us to take them down. We cannot tackle all of these concerns by ourselves. Help us to work together that we may fulfill your greatest desire, that we may be one. Amen. The 14th station. Jesus is buried in the tomb. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come from Galilee with him followed behind. And when they had seen the tomb and the way in which his body was laid in it, they returned and prepared spices and perfumed oils. Then they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Jesus is laid to rest in a borrowed tomb. But we know this is not the end of the story, for Jesus will rise from the dead. An ancient homily for Holy Saturday explains that there is a great silence on earth today, a great silence and stillness. The whole earth keeps us silent because the king is asleep. Jesus' pierced, bloodied, and cold body is in the tomb, and there is silence. We wait. 
for this is not the end of the story, and just as the springtime buds blossom on the once bare trees, so too the hope of the resurrection stirs in the tomb, hewn from the stone. There is sorrow as we leave the graveside, but with the woman and with disciples, we will run to the tomb the next day, and we will find it empty. Coronavirus will pass. In the risen Lord, perfect love casts out of fear, and neither death nor any created thing, whatever, will be able to come between us and the love of God, known to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. In this spirit of hope and anticipation, let us pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. We close our prayer asking God to open our hearts and minds so that we may respond to all with the spirit of welcome and radical love. May we respond with authentic generosity and compassion towards all who are marginalized and in need. Let us sing together the prayer for generosity. What do you want from me? What do you want from me? Have you ever said those words? Think about it. Like when you're frustrated, maybe with your parents, and you're exhausted because you really are trying your best, and you feel they want more, and you feel that they're just not satisfied, and you say, what do you want from me? Or maybe the coach won't back down until you get it exactly right, even after you've tried and tried and you want to give up. What do you want from me, coach? or the teacher who keeps pushing you to revise and revise, and you just want to say, this is my final draft. What do you want from me? And when you think about it, when you ask the question, you don't really want to know the answer. You just say it out of frustration, or maybe anger, or maybe even arrogance. What do you want from me? With tomorrow being Holy Thursday, I think of Mark's gospel story when Jesus asks Peter, James, and John to stay awake while he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus returns to them, he finds them asleep. This happens three times. Jesus knew the suffering that awaited him, and he just needed his best friends to be present and support him. Jesus calls them out, enough, and is frustrated with them. 
in the Gospel of Mark, the disciples have no answer for Jesus. But I wonder how our boy Peter felt when Jesus confronted him. Did he want to say, Jesus, what do you want from me? And like us, if Peter really did say something like that, did he really want to know the answer from God? This Lenten season, I also wonder about John. Johnny. Johnny Lawrence from Cobra Kai. If you haven't seen it, it's the movie Karate Kid, but 30 years later. I love that show. Totally have binge watched it. I don't know why I like it so much though. Maybe it gives me a sense of nostalgia, reminding me when I was a kid. Maybe I really like the character of Johnny Lawrence and I'm rooting for him. Maybe it's just cool to watch the same characters played by the same actors, but I get to watch it with my own kids. They love it. So of course I had to watch the 1984 movie Karate Kid with them. One scene struck me. The teacher, Mr. Miyagi, is showing his student Daniel how to prune a bonsai tree and Daniel is so nervous because he doesn't want to mess up the tree. So Miyagi hands him the small scissors and says, close eyes, trust, concentrate, think only tree. I love that phrase. Close eyes, trust, concentrate, think only tree. These days when you close your eyes and concentrate, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? Is it think only prep? Think only your sport? Is it think only college choice, or spring break, or your family, or a summer job? Maybe it's some or all of the above. During these days leading up to Easter, a time of hope and rejoicing and rebirth, especially in 2021, I'm challenging you to find some time and clear your mind, truly. Close eyes, trust, concentrate, think only God. Think only God and just listen, just listen. And if you truly want to say something to God, say, what do you want from me? And truly mean it and truly desire the answer and listen. Gentlemen, have a great Easter. I love you. Let's go prep.